Good morning. morning. So, all the snow on the ground, you think there's going to be school tomorrow? No. (laughs) Do we want there to be school tomorrow? No. Oh, well, that's mixed too. That's pretty good. (laughs) Okay. Well, you know what? I bet, I bet. Okay, well, yes, yeah, Thanksgiving. Skip, Thanksgiving comes whether there's snow or not. That's just the way it is. Well, you know, the, 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 the big kids, the big kids probably wouldn't mind having an extra couple of days because this is the time of the year when you have big tests and exams, right? Yeah, you don't have to do that yet, do you? Do you have tests? Yeah? Not big tests. Big tests? Big tests. Well... We're going to have a big test today, too. How's that sound? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Turn around, look at the screen. Who's that guy? Jesus. Are you sure? Yes. How do you know? Because I, he's had a vision made of what he might have looked like. Like what might he might have looked like. That's right. And, and this, is, this is one that's really popular, right? We all know this one because it's in all our Sunday school rooms, and we've seen it. How about this guy? Who's this guy? Jesus. Really? Yeah. Okay. How about this one? Jesus. Jesus? He didn't have a crown on his head in any of the others. Did he? God. God? Well, God and Jesus. Yeah, you know, same basic thing. No, that's Jesus. Today is called Christ the King Day, and so we think of Jesus with a crown today. That's why we have, I'm wearing white stole, and we have everything changed to white. Christ the King Day. How about, how about, now we're going to get a tough one. How about this picture? Jesus. Because in, like, some Bible. Uh Uh-huh. That's the picture? Wow. That's neat. How about this picture? Who's this? Jesus. Yeah, I can't fool you guys at all. You're getting them all right. Is there one more? I can't remember. Oh, one more. Jesus. Well, there you go. And and that's exactly, you know what? You know what, Aaron? You said it right. You said it right from the very beginning. And the important message I wanted you to know, but you already know it. What we're going to celebrate with Christmas and Advent is the idea that Jesus came to earth to be one of us. And we don't know exactly what he looked like. But he looked like all of us. And it doesn't matter what color we paint his skin or how we look at him or what his hair looks like. It's that we can all identify Jesus as looking like us. And this is one of the best times of the year when we can remember that. Because who's ever been to a nativity show? Have you ever been to a a place where they have nativity sets from all over the world set out and they show them all off? And there's a nativity set from Africa. And you know what? Jesus looks African. And there's a nativity set from China and Jesus looks Chinese. And there's a nativity set from Thailand and Jesus looks like he's Thai. There's a nativity set from India. He looks Indian. Because Jesus came to look like all of us. That's the important thing to remember. Whenever we see a picture of Jesus, it's okay whatever people think he looks like, as long as we can see that he looks like us. Can we remember that? You already know it, so it's easy to remember, right? Do you all know that? Okay, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for coming into the world looking like us. It wasn't to lower yourself. It was to make us feel better and to lift us up. Help us to remember that this week and this season of Christmas. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming up here.
Last week I was throwing pieces of my sermon away. This week we're just going to throw the scripture right out the door. How's that sound? No, not quite. But we'll see. Let us pray. I lift mine eyes into the hills whence cometh my help. My help is in the name of the Lord who makes heaven and earth. Grab blessing on this time spent that the words spoken and the words heard might be one and the same. Spoken and heard, they will be pleasing in your sight. Amen. The liturgical calendar does not run the same as our Gregorian calendar runs. In short, there are two dates that determine everything else. Christmas and Passover. Christmas establishes the first Sunday of Advent, which is our new year, the beginning of the Christian year. Passover establishes the date of Easter, and by default, Lent and Pentecost as well. And from that, we get all the rest of our liturgical colors, and the dates of our festivals, and everything that we hold holy. Next week being the first Sunday of Advent, that makes this the last Sunday of our year. And so it is the one place in our common lectionary where we turn to the end of the story and pastors have to dust off their one necessary time to preach on the book of Revelation. Fire, smoke, hell, damnation, brimstone, judgment, demons, punishment, war, pestilence, earthquake, destruction, and finally heaven. At least that's what comes to mind to most people when you bring up the book, Revelation. But whenever I have taught the class or led the serious Bible study to read the book, because we're all fascinated by it, come down to figuring out that it's fairly confusing, it's difficult and challenging, and none of that's necessarily a bad thing. Just to make that point this morning... I need a brave volunteer. Who's, who's going to be a... These are not the brave volunteers. Who's going to be my brave volunteer? Come now, come now. We don't get to move forward till we have one. You want to do it? Come on. Somewhere I read, a child shall lead them. There you go. Get all those colors. You can put them down over here. Even get an eraser in case you make a mistake. You're going to draw us a picture. That sound good? Okay. I'll tell you when you need to start drawing. Then you draw what I describe. All right? Revelation chapter 4. After this I looked, and there in heaven a door stood open, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place. At once I was in the Spirit, and there in heaven, you're going to draw heaven. How's that sound? Oh boy. You ready? Start drawing. A throne, and one seated on the throne. And the one seated there looked like Jasper and Carnelian. There's the throne. Okay, yeah. Good. And one seated on it that looked as Jasper and Carnelian.
Good. He's smiling too. That's nice. We have a happy God. Okay. And all around the throne was a rainbow that looked like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones. <laughs> and seated on the thrones were 24 elders dressed in white robes and golden crowns. That's good. Make them small because <laughs> there's lots of them. <laughs> You can tell us when you said that there's 24 up there. We won't, we won't count them. <laughs> White robes, there we go. That looks like 24 to me. I think you're good. Okay, coming from the throne were flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And in front of the throne burned seven flaming torches. which were the seven spirits of God. And in front of the throne there is something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And on each side of the throne were one of four living creatures. The first creature looked like a lion, And the second creature looked like an ox. And the third creature like a human face. And the fourth creature, like a flying eagle. And each of them had six wings. <laughs> and eyes all around them. <laughs> you don't have to draw the rest of it. You can just, you, you, get, you work on the eyes and the wings. I'll keep reading. And day and night without ceasing they sang, Holy, 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 the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to one who was seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fell before the one who was seated on the throne and worshiped the one who lives forever and ever. And they cast their golden crowns before the throne, singing, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good job. Thank you very much. <laughs> <clears throat> Can you see she ended with a question mark? How fitting is that? Perfect. So when it comes to trying to comprehend the images of Revelation, 
It's hard enough to deal with the ideas of emerald rainbows, a complete contradiction considering rainbows by definition are a spectrum of color. Beasts such as a man's face with six wings and eyes all over it. Are there eyes on the eyes? I mean, come on. Strange and surreal. And those are the things that we can almost, almost comprehend and put into an image, let alone the countless other images in the book that have no meaning or comprehension to us whatsoever. So why do we have it in the Bible? What are we supposed to do with all this today? Well, I need to point out, it almost didn't make the cut. The Council of Nicaea, while they were formulating the scriptures and putting the canon and the creeds together that make up our basic beliefs, they nearly rejected the book of Revelation. As early as the second century, questions arose about the reliability of its authorship. The author is simply noted as John. And there is no real evidence to tie Revelation to the Apostle John, although traditionally that's what we tend to do. Scholars will simply say, authored by John of Patmos. Most scholars reject the suggestion that the person who wrote the Gospel of John also wrote the book of Revelation. And they also raise concerns about the possible misuse and misinterpretations due to the difficulty of even second century Christians close to the time when it was written, when the symbols would mean so much and would be understood, already could not understand what the symbols necessarily meant let alone us, two millennia later. Okay, a little congregational test now. We've tested the kids. We tested our artist. See how the congregation does. Where does the term antichrist come from in Scripture? Anyone? Loud voice. Come on. Revelation. Revelation. Said with conviction. Wrong. Nowhere in the book of Revelation is the term even used. It comes from the epistles of John. The first and second one have notes. notes most notably is 1 John. Click it. There we go. 2.22. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. An Antichrist is not some great, powerful, evil entity. It is simply someone who does not believe in Jesus as Christ. And therefore they are anti Christ. We have twisted and misused these interpretations for years and years, and we do so at our own calamity. So again, we ask what does Revelation have for us today? Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, believed Revelation contained nothing prophetic, nothing that could lead us or the reader to Christ. I differ with him. But we need to point out a few things. As good, faithful Methodists, we have two basic ways in which we look at Scripture. And our discipline and our dogma and our polity give preference to neither. You can look at Scripture as the inerrant Word of God. 
Or you can look at Scripture as a communication to humankind from God that must be read with discernment and understanding because it's not all meant to be literal. Some of it is symbolic and allegorical. The Scripture always serves as the ruling guide of our faith, regardless of which way you look at it. It contains all things needful for our salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. So as Methodists, we continue to have the dialogue and study, regardless of how we view Scripture, until we know the right. Within that construct, there are three accepted viewpoints on how we read Revelation. First, there is the traditional orthodox position. The revelation describes an ultimate, final judgment of the earth by God, the end of the world. As I tell classes I have led, those who choose this viewpoint need to to find to rectify some of the inexactitudes, the final chapters, some of the unexpected loose ends to people who seem to continue on even though they're outside of God's chosen elect. Version 2. The book was written to a specific group of Christians, communities facing persecution under Rome, as encouragement to face those persecutions and not lose their faith. It is not about cosmic prophetic judgment other than being faithful to God in your own heart and soul. Again, a warning to those who claim this outlook, because it's difficult to compare and gain understanding with the metaphors and allegories that are outdated and do not speak to the understanding of our culture. And lastly, like Martin Luther, there are those who just choose to ignore it completely. It never should have been in the Bible, and so they put it aside as such. Again, a point of note. We are told the scripture is complete and perfect, and to set any part of it aside is to do so at our peril. You can come to it from any one of those points of view. My personal preference happens to be part two. But I don't put it upon anyone else. It's just how I choose to look at it. But if we look at it in that voice, the word to those being persecuted, then it has a particular meaning to us today. While I, we, are not persecuted unto death, we face our fair share of persecutions. That may sound strange coming from me. I'm not big on the whole happy holidays argument. I've already spoken about some thoughts on the Ten Commandment postings and prayer in school and the role of government in church should be separate. We have freedoms, and we can enjoy those freedoms. It is our role to live out our Christian lives and witness that good news. And while I don't think that that faces government persecution, it faces persecution in society today. Christianity is not meant to be easy actually meant to be quite difficult. And it doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. It doesn't matter how much money you have or how much money you don't have. It doesn't matter how much talent you have or how much talent you don't have. Somewhere, somewhere, there is cost to submitting ourselves to the will of God each and every minute of each and every day. Submitting ourselves to the will of God to the point 
of letting go of self. And in this society that claims personal freedom, personal expression, we as Christians can find ourselves quickly on the outside of society. We sacrifice in the name of our faith in God, not before an oppressive government. Oftentimes, before the oppression of our own wants and desires. I'm too old, I've done my time to help out in that way. I'm too new, I don't know how to be of service. That's just not one of my gifts. We tell ourselves all sorts of things to avoid the call of God. And in those places, we fall to the persecution of self. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, a little confession. Contrary to your popular notion and your accolades, which I thank you for, I, I honestly do not sing. Ask Susie. She hears me muddle through the hymns or anything else I'm doing up here. Actually, all you have to do, from what I understand from some people, is watch the cable because my mic is still live when I'm singing. And I hit more than a few sour notes, so I'm told. I am not a natural performer. I don't play instruments. My mentor, Dean Feldmeyer, now he could sing. He could sing. Intimidating for four years. Praise God I'm deaf on this side. But when I was preaching, I'd be right on this side of him, and he'd be right here in my voice, singing in his deep baritone, always on pitch, harmonizing with whatever else was going on. I don't sing. But for the purposes of God, I set those fears aside. And as you will quickly find, my tradition is, at Advent and at Lent, to sing my benedictions. I do it because that's the call God has placed upon me. It is dramatic. It adds to the moment. And more than that, I get to pick exactly what pitch I start at. Then I don't do so bad. The revelation promises in the face of any and all persecutions, whether external from society or internal from the heart. God stands with us. And if we are willing, strengthens us and emboldens us to the tasks. And failing to be within our comfort supports us and gives us strength to step out beyond them. And God never leaves us. Behold this day. Christ is king, even unto the end of the world. Declare it boldly in everything that you do, for it is our faith, our belief, our certain knowledge, and that is our witness to the world. Amen.